If, it was, if it's the morning rustle and it sounds goofy, you can always cut that bit out and just roll with the question yeah. that you're going to... Oh, okay. yeah. And I'll do the same. Hey, teams, and here you go. On, and then on okay. we go. Right, there laughing. you go. <laughs> 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 That's why I was hoping we could just keep rolling. Oh no, I have to start the start. Okay. Morning, Russell. What, what are you up to here? Hi, Tams, and how you going? Uh, yeah, so just pulling the chains off. Um, they're not really presenting a problem in that they're hooked up here over the hooks in the centre, but uh, they're just actually flicking around. Because it's so rough, they're flicking around and actually rubbing on the press wheel. So I'm just um, pulling them off, get them out of the way. Uh, they're not tangling up with any, any of the stubble or anything, but um, yeah, just stop them wearing the press wheels out and wearing the chain out basically. So okay. get them off and then we'll get going. And then, so just explain the setup here. What, what have you got? Okay, yeah, so this is a nine metre uh, XL planter. Um, we've got the double disc units on it. Uh, so there's 20 units in, in the nine metres, um, it, which is a bit of an odd layout, I guess, for a lot of people, but um, that's what we run with. and. Um, so yeah, basically just a, a two bin air seeder behind it um, that blows the seed or delivers the seed into the units. So we're currently running uh, obviously both bins uh, and in the front bin we've got our sugar drip. Sugar drip um, is just a, a forage sorghum. So it's an older, just an open pollinated one. So it's not a hybrid. And yeah, it'll grow sort of six or eight feet tall, no worries at all in a reasonable year. If it does work with the multi-species, that's yeah. perfect. Sugar drip will be similar to the sorghum in the way it grows and, and how these other things impact on it or don't or whatever. So it'll give me a good idea this year yeah. with what that current mix that we're putting in now does. Mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the season, we'll have a rough idea on what it's, how it's going to be with sorghum too. And in the front bin, we've got our sugar drip, um, which we're putting on at uh, four kilos to the hectare. Or well, that's what we've aimed at. That's what we've calibrated for. Uh, and then the, um, the mix, so the sunflower, the radish, the linseed and the phacelia, that complete mix I've aimed at one and a half kilos to the hectare on that. I was planning on spreading the fenugreek on top of the ground with some flowers as well. But because it was too windy, um, I actually ended up doing it through this same machine. So I mixed the fenugreek and the flowers, the alyssums and the dill together. Basically, the fenugreek was only there to carry the seed of the flowers. Otherwise, as you can appreciate, you know, I would have needed probably five kilos or more of flower seed to be able to meter it through our metering systems. They're not that, that sort of fine that they can work on, you know, a couple hundred grams of seed at all. So I mix that in with the fenugreek just to give us more stuff to carry. To, to spread the flower seeds out, I suppose. So yeah, last night I ran that on, so I just did it with the machine out of the ground um, and just drove through it and blew the seed on top of the ground. And then today we're gonna come back through and uh, put these things in the ground. So we'll, we'll drop them in about two inches deep, roughly. We're going into dry soil, which is not something we've ever done before, but I know it's certainly plenty of people have dry planted in the past. And I guess, you know, from what I just did a little bit of a trial there last night um, when I was doing the fenugreek and it seemed to work fine by going straight up the rows that we planted the winter mix into. So I'll be aiming at doing that again. We'll just go straight up that row and drop those five things into that um, slot again. So yeah, the twin discs seem to work pretty well in our conditions. I guess there is also a single disc one available, but um, we, we use the, the double disc planter. We create a, a V-shaped trench. We then deliver liquid into that trench uh, from the, the tank on the front of the tractor. Uh, we drop it in prior to closing that trench so the liquid's going down on the seed. We generally run that liquid at about 200 litres of total liquid per hectare. In that liquid this time we've got four different things. So we've got um, some Nutrisoil LS, we've got some Active Fert Soil Life, we've got molasses and we've got some rum as well. Um, and that's not the rum you drink. Um, you know, liquid that's got some goodies in it. So yeah, we're putting all of those on at one litre per hectare. So basically we've got four litres of the combination of those things uh, going in with the 200 litres of, of water uh, per hectare in the paddock. The reason why we've got the two bins set up going with the seed is so that we could split our rate. So we had the sugar drip obviously going on at a higher rate than what the other four were. So we needed to be able to calibrate both boxes individually to get that rate right. That enabled us to make sure we had enough sugar drip 
uh, you know, that we wanted. And, and as far as the other four that went in, we've got no idea how much to put on. This is just a great big trial, but no one can really tell us how much to put that mix on at. So I just had a bit of a stab at that sort of rate. Well, hopefully it's thick enough or not too, too thick. But yeah, we'll know, obviously, you know, in a month or two's time, assuming it rains and we actually get it up. And, you know, they're certainly talking good rain to come through basically from tonight or this afternoon onward. I'm kind of hoping we'll get 30 to 50 mil. And that's what the weather forecasts are probably indicating that we could get that much because I'm doing this. I know we'll get five mil and it'll be a disaster. But anyway, that's the way it goes. I guess have a punt and see what happens. With your seed, they've been inoculated? Yeah, that's right. Yep. So um, all of the seed was inoculated with active start just at the recommended rate and uh, yeah just did that in a cement mixer which which worked fine but um, it was actually a bit of a trick because the four things that we put in the ground so the sunflowers radish linseed and phacelia actually separated themselves out pretty well in the <laughs> cement mixer so who needs a grader when you've got a cement mixer so the sunflowers being the lightest came to the top and other things sort of generally stayed pretty much mixed up below that so all we did was um, add the inoculant in let it mix up and then we just we just remixed it basically in a tub that we had there with a shovel just stirred it up again to try and get that spread of the seed right through the mix one little trap that i wasn't expecting to see but anyway so yeah it's feeling a bit bouncy it's, yeah it's quite rough actually and that's um that's the reason why we're only doing like six k's an hour because it's just a bit hard on the units they're, they're bouncing pretty well and um yeah just going slow just to try and protect everything and not, not destroy the machine in in the um 14 hectares i'm doing and i guess when you've got rough conditions and your units are starting to bounce a bit the faster you go in those conditions the less accurate you are with the placement of your seed too so it's you know it's not only looking after the gear but it's also trying to maintain that seed placement as accurately as you can within reason yeah yeah so how do you think it's faring with the turnip in there because we weren't quite sure whether it was going to get in the way yeah for sure and yeah you can in places see the units bouncing over those turnips so it's not ideal but um I thought it was worth going straight up that row again, just that so, just so you've got like pretty good stubble there, probably better than where it is in the gaps between the rows. The stubble's quite quite reasonable in that row, so that's going to help protect any moisture that we do get from rain coming through. Kind of decided I'd deal with the turnips and let the machine bounce over them, which they, they're quite soft now really, and it's cutting them open easily and, and dropping the seed down there anyway. So they're not a big problem, probably not ideal, but um, we'll just go straight down that row and try and hope that any moisture we do get gets a bit protected by the fact that it's um, got that good stubble cover over it. And I suppose that both the, the oats, isn't it, and the radish are still sort of alive. Yeah. So yep. their roots are still active. Yep. Do you think that's going to help the seeds at all? It could be a two-way street there, I guess. It, it could help in that obviously those plants are pulling moisture up and that sort of thing, but also as they get more growth on them, they're also going to be sucking more moisture that probably will start to take it away from the seed too. So I guess it, it's one of those things you won't really know until, you know, a couple of weeks time. But, you know, the moisture in the ground is not disastrous. Like it's, it is dry on top, but go down sort of four inches and there's reasonable moisture down there. It's probably really need, ideally 50 mil would wet this up pretty nice, but um, yeah, we'll know in a few days how much we actually get. Did that surprise you? Because you took a shovel to it and went, oh, it's quite moist down here. Yeah, it did. Because, you know, when the crop was getting towards that stage where we were ready to crimp it, it, it certainly was hooking into the moisture pretty hard. And I was actually surprised that it hadn't dried it out further than what it had because, you know, we crimped that crop, so I think it was the 1st of September, and we really hadn't had any decent rain since the end of July. You know, we'd had a, a fair bit of moisture coming out in August that had nothing going back in on. You know, normally that in a monoculture crop, you start to see that moisture disappear pretty quick. And I was actually surprised how that moisture is hung on in the soil uh, considering we had so much bulk of material there and growing so well that it actually held on as good as it did yeah, for moisture. Would you have seen the same results if it, if it was bare fallow? I guess because you don't have a crop there sucking it out you don't get, have that draining effect on it but I would think over that period of time of being bare fallow and dry for that long without rain it mightn't have been down four inches but it'd certainly be starting to get down there yeah the top would definitely be drying out. We've lost a bit no doubt by having that multi species crop there, but I think we'll gain so much in every, every other way. Do you think it may have pulled it up a little bit from further below? Could have done, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, we were lucky we started this season with a good profile of moisture and we had good in-crop rain through until you know, probably mid-July. That certainly helped us a lot too, you know. It's, it, when the bank's full, it's it's pretty good, a good start, and then just keep topping it up like it did. It was really the perfect season for us, in the start anyway, yeah. yeah. yeah.
Let's get down to the nitty gritty then with the whole business side of, of it because we know that you're going to profit with the quality of your soil and improving, regenerating your soil. Uh, you want to do the multi-species cover crop planting for three to four years, which is considerable amount of time. I've never actually heard anybody sort of giving up their paddock for this, for that length of time. If you notice really good results within the first couple of years, maybe 18 months or two years, because that would be like three or four plantings, yeah. what then could you go into to actually get some cash? And yeah. what we've done now with this summer mix obviously has a cash component that I'm hoping to harvest the sugar drip out of this particular mix that we're putting in now. So, oh, so you're <coughs> hoping a cash crop already? Yeah, this one, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So, really? yeah, so the sugar drip is the one that we're hoping to harvest. Uh, but, you know, bear in mind that'll be dependent on moisture and how this all performs too. But, yeah, that's the plan is to go into that uh, cash crop this time. Oh, good. I'm, I'm really happy about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so is the bank manager probably too. <laughs> so pretty much that's why... Um, I guess I chose the things to go in with the sugar drip that I have. So the sunflowers being uh, mycorrhizal, the radish linseed and fascia, they all do an important thing in the soil. And I'm not across exactly all the things that they, they do and the nutrients they pull up and make available, but I've had some very good advice that they're well worth putting in. So I'll just run with that part of it. Yeah, definitely the choice of the sugar drip was the height thing. So it should grow higher than the others, assuming the season is reasonable, which will allow us to pretty much harvest that wholly and solely on its own. I mean, we may run into some sunflowers in that mix in the header, but they won't be too hard to get out when we grade it. So I'm not concerned about that at all. What's uh, the length of growing time or, or going to seed time for your sugar drip? Uh, look, it's, it's a funny one. It's got the ability, we've had it here in the last few years where it's basically looked like it's dead. Got to sort of one, one and a half metres tall. Looked like you'd just spread it out with Roundup, like gone from green to dead in a matter of sort of six or eight weeks because the season's just gone bad. And then we've had really decent rain and it's come away and been quite a good crop. It's a pretty handy forage in that it's got the ability to just sort of shut down, wait till it rains and then lift off again. And, and like within a fortnight, it's gone from looking basically dead to being green and beautiful and wow. away, you know. With the <coughs> other crops that you've planted with it, it won't matter at all then the time frame no no it just means that those crops that we have planted with it those other mixes will more than likely have all seeded so there'll be no opportunity for us to stop them seeding in that mix they will go through and seed and that won't matter because they're a lot shorter yeah hopefully okay. and i think we should be able to deal with them in subsequent years too i don't see them as a really big problem for us in future cropping plans. I'm quite comfortable with the fact that we've put them in there. Uh, but yeah, I definitely am planning on that they will all be seeded and finished by the time we get to harvest the sugar drip. So I know we're going to have them in the seed bank for a while. Okay. Going and then your future plans then with, with what you're planting, what what would be your cash crops as such? Next year, like, uh, and again, it's weather dependent uh, and I'm kind of doing something that goes against how we've normally farmed and basically I'm double cropping everything. It's not about really the cash crop side of it, it's about building that soil health as quick as I can and seeing what we can actually achieve. Again, I would go back into a winter one and obviously I'd, I'd probably, if I want to get a cash component in that winter one, I need to rethink what I put in with that because what we've done this year is great, but it's probably going to be quite difficult to harvest and to separate and everything else in in the form of a seed line. Um, great for crimping, except for the turnip. But um, yeah, as far as a seed, a harvestable crop goes, we'd have to change what we did there. Are you having a practice run with the other paddock? Yeah, just going to see what it does. I'm really glad we've left it. Like it wasn't ready to crimp when we crimped the rest of it. Really just curious to see how it behaves. And it certainly stayed as fresh as, you know, I can't believe how fresh the paddock is still on virtually no rain for as long as it's been and, and the amount of biomass that's on top. It's just a case of watch it and see and learn as much as I can. So there's only three hectares in that bit. So how far off do you think it is from Oh, if it was to be harvested, I don't know, it's, it's probably a month or six weeks at least. Like, I'd only be guessing, but if nothing else is, I wouldn't be harvesting it until the end because if I harvest it last, the next thing the header will probably go into is sorghum. So it won't matter if there's a few of those things in there. And I mean, there'd only be probably half a cupful in the header, but it's just that job of knowing you've really got it perfectly clean. Do all the wheat and chickpeas and everything we've got to do as our main cash crops now and come back and play with that when I've got plenty of time and lots of patience I'd say. Yeah, cereals ripening. Yeah, the yeah. The isn't. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, mainly the triticale is the stuff that's ripening now. Um, the oats being so far behind them was quite slow to 
obviously get to maturity and that, and that's why we had trouble killing it when we crimped it because it was so far behind. So it, it's it's still the same case in that crop that is still growing as a multi species now. Like three or four weeks ago when you were here, they were only just starting to throw heads out then. Usually six weeks from flowering, you're starting to get close to mature seed in some of those things, So, which will be good because our other crops will be um, you know, well and truly in front of it to harvest. So we should have most of that done before this is actually ripe. Yeah, mm. here's the plan.